Simulations Piaggio P149. Uh, and if you think that was a bit of a bizarre song choice, watch the video and you'll realize why I've picked it. Um, but let's go on with looking at the, uh, the um, aeroplane. Come on. <laughs> okay, so here we are in Microsoft Flight Simulator. Um, we are at the default Barton Aerodrome or City Airport Manchester as it's known these days. That's Echo Golf Charlie Bravo. Uh, very nice bit of scenery um, and it's uh, just a little bit outside Manchester uh, near, near the Trafford Centre and the big ski place and all that kind of stuff if you're from the area uh, just up the road from Manchester United's ground <laughs> now the reason I've come here is one it's nice scenery to fly from but two um, I'm not sure if it's still based there but there was up until fairly recently um, one of these things a Piaggio P149 that was based at Barton uh, and I've seen it fly from there a few times and had a look around it and all that kind of stuff so uh, it's as good a place as any uh, to look at this thing so this is the AT simulations Piaggio P149 sometimes referred to as the Focke Wolf or FW P149 because it was uh, built in Italy but it was also built in Germany uh, by Focke Wolf now um, so this thing, AT Simulations, it costs $24.99, um, so about 23 quid, 23 euros, that sort of thing, depending on how the exchange rate goes. So it's not that expensive, it's a sort of typical price of, uh, of, of a lot of GA aeroplanes for Microsoft Flight Simulator, roughly the same price as a Carinado uh, Cessna or something like that, so not particularly expensive. Um, for that, um, you get um, quite a few paint jobs. Um, and theoretically you're getting two airplanes because there's the Piaggio version and the um, the Focke Wolf version but in practice it's one model um, there were on if you look at the real things if you look at a Piaggio built one and you look at a Focke Wolf built one there are a few visual differences obviously because they're built at two different factories but they're broadly similar and probably you'd need to look at the data plate in the cockpit to know whether it was a Piaggio built one or a, or a Focke Wolf built one so uh, in practice it's one model plane um, and very nice it is too as you can see um, and one of the interesting things you can see is that it's a four seater you don't have to have the people in it if you don't want to you can get rid if you like which we will do so we'll get rid of that and 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 you can see this thing springing up um, so it is affecting the weight of the thing should be a bit more sprightly with uh, with just one person in it um, it is a very very pretty model I think this is one of the prettiest airplanes ever built to be honest um, it, what it, it kind of reminds me <coughs> of the, if you saw a, a, a little airplane drawn in a children's book um, it's got that kind of look about it I just think it's really really cute um, very very pretty thing and it, it really suits bright colors like reds and yellows and stuff like that um, and there are paint schemes like that um, that come with it I, I really like this sort of like trainer yellow color that it's got it looks great in red as well 
Um, now, if we have a look closer at it, you can see the level of detail on the model. Um, we can see the flap actuators up there, and you can see the PBR textures on the wheels and tires and all that kind of stuff, and the metal and what have you. So it is really, really nicely textured with all PBR stuff, and it's really nicely modeled as well. There's a lot of detail, you know, the trim tabs all move and all this kind of stuff uh, and what have you. So it is really, really nicely detailed. Um, and but what really, really sets this apart is, uh, even though it's a nice model and it's well textured on the outside, what I think really sets this thing apart is the interior, because I personally think that this has got one of the best detailed cockpits of any add-on that you can get for Microsoft Flight Simulator. It's really, really atmospheric and really, really well detailed. So let's have a look inside of the thing. Um, and you can see whether you, you think you agree with me. Now, obviously, this is an aeroplane that the real thing dates from the 1950s and 1960s. That's when they were built. Um, so it's really got that look uh, of it. And if I zoom in on this, you can see that what it's got is that kind of pressed metal painted with hammered paint, like hammerite, that sort of, uh, if you know that brand of paint. Um, and I just think it's so well done. I mean, it looks like you could reach out and tap that um, that that panel and get a sort of metal noise out of the thing. I just think it's so beautifully done. Um, and the wear and tear levels on it are really, really well done. So um, that, I think, is really great. If you look at that trim wheel there, um, that has got that sort of like slightly yellowing um sort of acetate look to it the metal on the floor looks like you know some heels of some boots have have worn the metal a bit the um the handle on the control column looks good those that, that sort of padding sound deadening stuff on the side has got that warm look the the leather on the seats is really good the metal on the the canopy and what have you and that that handle where you uh you pull the canopy short and this thing where you lock it is really, really good. Um, so I just think the detailing on this and the way it's been textured is really, really beautiful. I mean, look at that, the sort of anodized alloy of um, of the mounting screw fitting for the um, for the uh, mixture control there. I just think it's so beautifully done. Um, it just looks really, really good. This is a cut above most texturing in most cockpits, in my opinion. Um, but um, what really sells it, in addition to the fact that it's beautifully textured, is it's also got really, really beautiful sounds. Now, if you um, if you're familiar with sort of equipment that dates from this era that's usually finished in that sort of hammered metal paint i'm talking about things like amplifiers tape recorders um transformers for model train sets and all this kind of stuff you you from the sort of 1950s and 1960s um you'll probably be familiar with the switches that you got on stuff like that and the noise that they made and the noise that they make is this it's got a a little bit of a sort of spring sound to it um, uh, and I just think they've got the sound really really spot on on that and there's there's loads of loads of little touches like that when you move things they they make a really really convincing sound for example this thing here that yeah uh, this is you know it, it's, it doesn't even really do much in the simulator other than uh, than open a sort of vent for the for the windshield but you've got that kind of spring noise on there i'm sure you sure you can hear that and then when we this this little air vent when we swivel that round you get a bit of a squeak on it and things like that fuel control switch when we put that in good sound the um the suction for the engine primer and stuff like that it's just all really really good the sounds really really add to it so it looks great and it sounds great as well um now in addition to that um almost everything on this panel functions there's one or two things that don't so what i'll do is i'll take you through everything that works on it and does stuff um so uh, what i'm going to do first is i'm going to come up here and get all of these switches on so let's have a look at what these switches are so we've got the battery and we're going to start hearing noises when that goes on like that and then we've got um the beacon light and then we've got an oil gauge circuit what that's going to do is that's going to turn on the the circuit for the um for the gauges on the panel and then what we've got is the fuel gauge circuit there and we've got the nav lights and then coming over here we've got the panel lights and we've got pitot heat and the gyros and then the radio 
and then the ADF like that now just before we um, we come out of the way I'm going to show you this as well because this is really really great there are two lamps on this thing um, that you can light the panel up with and uh, this is one of them and it's like I've got a rear stack control on it and just to show you how how this thing works and how nicely done it is what I'm gonna do is we're just gonna briefly turn it to night time so that you can see the light now if I do that and then get that out of the way what I'm going to do is I'm going to roll the mouse wheel and turn that on and we get that panel bathed in light and then you can maneuver this thing around which is uh, very very nice but it's not the only one um, because what you've also got if I back that off is we've also got this on a big pivot arm this lamp here and this thing also functions and you can swivel this thing around it can be a little bit tricky to maneuver sometimes but you can get this pretty much where you want with a bit of effort if you if you sort of i'm rolling the mouse wheel there to maneuver that um, and then obviously what i can do is i can start sort of pivoting it about and what have you um, but it's got a little switch control on the panel which i'm just going to have to move this a little bit there and we get that thing as well so you can maneuver this thing around if you want to and swivel it about um, with this this thing here so you can get this kind of where you want um, so if you like flying at night and you like atmospheric cockpit lighting then this thing is really really going to float your boat because it's got really really beautiful cockpit lighting now what I'll do is I'll pop this back on daylight there we go so we'll We'll call it lunchtime, shall we? <laughs> so, um, really, really nice cockpit lighting. Now, um, what I'll do is I'll come over here, uh, and what you can hear is you can hear the fuel pump. So I can turn that off. So what I'll do is I'll take you across the panel and show you all the stuff that actually works on this thing. So, um, starting on this side, you've got your throttle control, uh, obviously. <coughs> no surprises there. Uh, you've got your propeller control um, for the prop RPM. Like that, and I'll put that fully forward because we're going to be starting this at some point. And then we've got an air vent there, we've got the fuel control switch, which is open now. We can prime the engine there. We've got that little windshield vent uh, uh, thing there, uh, which will de ice the windshield if you want it to. There's a starter switch there that we're going to be using in a minute or two. We've got the magneto switches, so you've got um, magnetos off, magneto one, and magneto two. You've got the fuel pump there, like that which I'll turn back on in a moment or two. You can see that the indicator light for that, very nicely done. Um, then what we've got is we've got a G meter, which I can reset if that's moved. Um, and then what we've got is we've got fairly standard flying panel there with the instruments that you would expect. Um, but there are some options on it for whether you want to sort of slave that to some of the other navigation gear or not. Um, we'll uncage the artificial horizon. Like that. Um, when I put the power on, you'll see that um, stop being toppled and what have you. You've got the alternator fuse, which I'm going to make sure is on, otherwise our battery won't be charging. I've got a little chronograph there, which is now working because I've got the um, the battery on up there because I flicked all those switches on there. Um, we've got landing lights, left and right. I'll, uh, I'll take you on the outside view in a minute or two and we'll have a look at that. You've got the fuses here um, for some of these gauges down here and these do actually work when you press them. They unscrew out and you can see if you look at this um, cylinder head temperature gauge you can see that that is actually affecting it um, and that one will be affecting the um, I think it's I think that's the oil um, I don't know, it's that one there. So those things work as well um, which is really really nice. Uh, and you've got little vents there again great noises and the other vent there on the other side um, rudder trim now anyway these gauges so old school radios um, which means that you're not going to be using a GPS on this thing however what you can do is you can in Microsoft Flight Simulator you can set up a flight plan as though you've got a GPS and then what you can do is if you go on the VFR map the uh, the GPS track will be shown in magenta so you can do it you can use this to sort of steer down the line if you want or what you could also do is you could look up what the um, what the frequencies are, were of things for example if my flight plan had included um, going to um, 
I don't know Manchester Airport. Uh, I could use the the MCT VOR at Manchester, which I think is uh, is it one thirteen decimal five five, and there's the the, the old Woodford Aerodrome uh, um, non-directional beacon that's uh, I think is still there, and I think that's uh, four ninety, is it? I think. Uh, on the ADF, uh, so you can sort of do GPS navigation, and, and if you did that with that with that map open, it would be not dissimilar to what I've done in airplanes in real life, which didn't have a built-in GPS, which was just have a little handheld D GPS and sucker it to the windscreen um, and, and put just like a straight line of plan in and what have you, and then fly along it, you know what I mean, roughly and what have you. So you can see, you know, if you if you like GPS navigation, you can do that. Obviously, there's not going to be an autopilot following it, but you know, other than that, you're going to be all right. Now, uh, you've got uh, the mixture control there, uh, and so because we're going to be starting it shortly, I uh, will get the mixture, mixture control going. You've got the landing gear there. It's got a little guard on it there. You flick that out, and then you've got a landing gear switch. These are the fuses for the landing gear uh, and all that sort of stuff. We've got carburetor heat here. You've got the cowl flaps here. Um, if we pull that open there I'll show you where the cow flaps are we go on the external view and the cow flaps are that's that little thing that little door on the side there so you'll see when I swing that in a little bit come on you can do it there now they're only partially open I am going to get those open because uh, we're going to be starting this thing up you've got parking brake switch there like that um, I have to say, I've got, I love that texturing on there, that sort of anodized alloy on there. I just think it's fantastic. Um, most of these gauges work, not all of them. The, the ones that don't work are these two here. These are the gyro tuners, but um, since you've got sort of like gyros there and there um, for navigation, you're all right anyway. So it's only that thing there, which is a bit old school, um, that doesn't work. All the rest of this stuff does work. So you've got oil. Um, quantity and temperature gauge there you've got an rpm gauge there you've got um cylinder head temperature and um, fuel pressure there you've got uh, radio navigation stuff there you've got a little voltmeter there you've got these things work um that's your rudder trim there um you've got old school radios um they might be old-fashioned but they do work um you just make sure that you get them all turned on and what have you so you know if I wanted to go for that um, that VOR at Manchester Airport I can cheerfully get the volume up for that and then I can tune that in that's uh, that would be uh, what would it be 113 mm -mm -mm, come on you can do it uh, would be 55 five, and you and there we go. You saw the uh, to and from needle swing there, and I'm getting the uh, the audio for um, Manchester, so it'll be giving me Morse code MCT. Uh, I'll turn that down, otherwise that'll get a little bit annoying. <laughs> um, so there you go. Most of the, it's really only this thing here that doesn't work on the panel. Pretty much everything else does. Um, you've got uh, friction lever for the the throttles there. Um, there is an elevator trim indicator and it's I'm going to show you is there I'll roll my hardware trim wheel there and you can see that that thing is actually moving it's a little bit blocked by the uh, by the prop lever but you can see that that thing does actually work um, and it makes a nice nice squeaking noise when you you maneuver it because what you you're effectively doing is rolling that little trim wheel there, I was using my little hardware thing. Um, so, uh, other things that are nice, yeah, there's your flap lever there, um, obviously you can use keyboard shortcuts, there's your fuel cock there for selecting different fuel tanks on the thing. Um, you've got, in the real thing that would be um, for emergency um, getting the gear down, doesn't function in this. Um, you're not likely to, to need that anyway. Um, and if we come back here, 
uh, zoom in there you can see the data plate for it you can see that that this is uh, allegedly a uh, a focke wolf built one at bremen uh, not a piaggio one um, they've scuffed that a bit because obviously they'll all end up with the same serial number but so that doesn't change depending regardless of which paint job you've got it's the same in all of them and what have you but you know are we really that bothered about it again really really beautiful texturing on the canopy frame there um and on this stuff here um, for the canopy that's the uh, the canopy handle for opening it what you need to do is you need to unlock that and then you can grab that and you can slide the canopy open or you can slide it short if you like so you can fly this thing with the canopy open if you want to um, which is is kind of fun um, to do so we have got a really really nice interior um, now uh, oh this thing yes it works um, can be a bit finicky to get it to open but it does actually open there and there we go you've got to kind of roll your mouse wheel to get that to open but the dv panel as you can see does open and there's one on the other side as well and that one opens as well you can see i'm not going to worry about it too much but you can see that that thing works as well so you know if your windows ice or you can get that thing open or if it's sort of condensed up and what have you you can uh, you can see where you're going um i'll just move the view down ever so slightly because I tend to prefer it a little bit lower. I do want to like to see a bit of the cowling, but you know, not too much. Um, if if you look to the side view, what it actually does do though, I'm going to flick this with the with the, um, the um, POV hat on my joystick, and you'll see that what it does is, is it just actually jumps your view up a little bit. If I do that the other way, you can see that. So yeah, yeah, that's kind of like. Um, turning your head to the side and craning your neck a bit which is kind of good you know because uh, if if you're in a bank turn looking for stuff it gives you a pretty good view out of the window so kind of nice really that um, so let's crank the thing up um, so we've got the fuel pump on um, like that, or at least we have now we've got the magnetos on there um, the fuel switch is open we've primed it a couple of times got the prop fully forward we're just going to crack the throttle a little bit we'll make sure that the parking brake is on like that if we were doing this for real we'd open the canopy and jump clear prop but uh, since we're in a simulator we don't need to worry about that too much i've got all of the lights on so i don't need to worry about that either so we should be in business and there you go like that. and if you if you want if i cut that And then do it again. There you, are. you get to see how the prop um, spins <laughs> spins up as well. Now, um, one thing that I will say about this is, even though there is a cylinder head temperature gauge and there's an oil temperature gauge and you know all that kind of stuff and what have you, um, it, this isn't an A to A. Um, model of, of engine or what have you so you know it's not you know you don't have to manage the engine too much you know what i mean it, it, you know i could cheerfully throttle this thing up like crazy um and get really really high cylinder head temperatures um and it's not going to make the engine blow up on it and what have you but of course just because it's not going to do that doesn't mean to say that you can't fly the thing properly so you know i'm going to keep those cow flaps open while i'm on the ground um and just uh, imagine that if i didn't do that the engines would overheat um so uh, i'll make sure that the altimeters set on zero uh, like that. and then let's go and take this thing for a little bit of a drive just before we do that let's have a look on the outside um, so you can see nav lights on there on the wingtips and you've got one on the top of the tail the one that doesn't light up or at least I've not found a way to light it up is that I'm pretty sure that should light up in white on the back but for some reason it doesn't seem to want to do it on mine um, and there's your your landing lights you can probably just about make out on the tarmac that they're sort of spilling on the ground a little bit uh, and what have you uh, and you can see there you can get a good idea of the size of the real thing 
Um, it tends to look, because it's kind of like a cute looking aeroplane, it tends to look a bit small. Um, but in actual fact, it is more or less the same size as a Cessna 172. It's, it's probably probably a foot longer than a Cessna 172 um, and the wingspan's more or less the same and it's a good four-seater um, you can see it alongside that Bonanza and it's actually bigger than it it's about more or less the same height as a Cessna 172 so even though it kind of looks like it's a small plane it's actually not that small so uh, I'm going to do good habits here and I keep the uh, get the flaps up while I'm taxiing um, and let's get this thing to the runway so, there we go. Uh, if you want to hear it from the outside when the engine's revving up. And we'll do our best not to hit a building. Right, I'm going to get in the cockpit here because what I want to see when I come round here... Hit a bit of wheel brakes. I want to see the wind sock. To see which way the wind's going. And we are a slight tailwind if we take off from this. But you know, what's that? That's about five, maybe six knots of tailwind. I think we can get away with that. Um, not the biggest airfield in the world, Barton, but. Um, Big enough to get this thing off, even with a bit of a tailwind. If it, if it was, you know, maybe a 15 knot wind tailwind or a 10 knot tailwind, I'd be taxiing it up the other end. Um, but I reckon we can get off with a bit of a tailwind. I've seen bigger stuff than uh, than this little Piaggio take off from uh, from Barton. And in World War Two, um, they occasionally landed Lancasters here. <laughs> Believe it or not, <laughs> doesn't look big enough, does it? Um, so um, you do have to give this some rudder to keep it straight. Um, and I'll keep the view like that. So it's initially going to go a little bit left, and then I might have to give it some rudder the other way. When it picks up a bit of speed. Depends on the wind. It seems to be getting away with it. And off it goes. Now you can see from that. That this thing will take off without flaps. You would normally. Probably use some flaps with it. For take off. But it will get off without flaps. And Barton is not a massive aerodrome. Um, so, um, I guess you could sort of conceivably use this as a bit of a bush flyer if you wanted to. Um, perhaps not the ideal aeroplane to use for bush flying, but it can do it. the A57 and all that lot. Um, now then. Just throttle it back a little bit. Now. Um, in case you haven't worked out what the tune was at the start of this video um, which was, if you remember um, Oh What a Circus um, from Ibiza and why I picked that. Um, the Piaggio P149 was originally made in Italy um, and after the end of World War II you probably know that a lot of uh, a lot of Germans disappeared to Argentina some of them were, were war criminals that were going hiding there um, but not all of them were um, some of them were aircraft designers um, and pilots that were going working for the aviation industry in Argentina because after the end of uh, end of the Second World War, 
um, most of the Allied countries wanted sort of German scientists and German pilots to come and work for them. Um, perhaps the most famous instance of that um, was Operation Paperclip, where um, the Americans had Werner von Braun, who'd been uh, making the V2 rockets um, for the Germans, go over and work for NASA and ultimately um, build the um, the Apollo space rockets. But the um, the Russians did that too. The British did it as well. Um, and the Argentinians did as well. And um, in 1946, um, Juan Perón, who was married to Evita, Eva Perón, um, was, um, came to power in 1946. And he sort of made it known that um, German engineers and scientists would be welcome in Argentina. I mean, you know, there's a bit more to it than that. It was actually helping a few war criminals escape. <laughs> escape sort of uh, justice from the Allies and what have you in uh, war crimes trials but um, there were a lot of uh, lot of engineers and pilots that went over there and one of the uh, one of the engineers that went over there um, to work in the aviation industry in um, in Argentina was a guy called Kurt Tank who you've probably heard of and if you've never heard of Kurt Tank he was the guy that designed the Fock Wolf 190 and the later versions of the Fock Wolf 190 um, were were called the TA-152 uh, or TA-52 um, as a bit of a tribute to uh, to, to him they, they, they allowed him to sort of name it after himself now because of um, because he'd gone over to Argentina to work um, and he carried on with the um, the jet fighter that he had been designing for the Germans in World War Two because he went over there um, one of the people that he got over to go over there with him to work as a test pilot was um, Adolf Galland, who had been um, the um, the general of fighters in uh, in Germany in World War Two, um, and he was sort of on, fallen on hard times a bit. I think he was working as a gardener on some estate at the time. He went over to Argentina. Um, uh, and started doing testing on uh, on jet fighters and what have you, including flying lost meteors and stuff like that. Uh, it, when he was in Argentina, um, and he, after he'd done that and sort of pulled himself up by his bootstraps and, and got involved in aviation, um, they he eventually went back to Germany when the Allies, by that time were wanting the German Air Force to start up again because of the Cold War, because East and West Germany were facing off against one another. So Adolf Galland was fairly instrumental when he came back from Argentina uh, to, to Germany in selecting aircraft um, for the, the new Luftwaffe. And one of the things that they needed was um, a, a training and liaison plane. And Adolf Galland um, teamed up with another fighter pilot um, who'd been in the Luftwaffe in World War II, who was a guy called Eduard Neumann, um, and both of them entered the International Air Rally race, and they flew a Piaggio P149, um, and they were very impressed with it. And at the time, um, the the two aircraft that they'd been looking at um, for a training aircraft for the Luftwaffe had been the Saab. Sapphire 91 and the other one was the uh, the um, Beechcraft T-34 Mentor which is basically a tandem seat version of the Beechcraft Bonanza um, and they had been the two aircraft that they were looking at but they flew this Piaggio uh, P149 and they actually came second in the race um, and they, they, that sounds like well why didn't they come first well you have to understand that in that race the weather was absolutely terrible there were seven planes crashed in the race there were loads of pilots killed so coming second was actually quite an impressive feat um, and so actually um, actually managing to come second was quite impressive um, and so in coming second in the race in that Piaggio P149 um, and it being a four-seater that could be used as a liaison aircraft as well as making a fairly good training plane what they uh, what they said was well let's enter that in the competition to select the training aircraft for the Luftwaffe so there were three aircraft in that competition there was 
the T-34 Beechcraft Mentor, there was the um, Saab 91 Sapphire, and then there was the Piaggio P-149, this thing. Um, and they were test flying them all against one another, and the Piaggio P-149 was doing really, really well in the contest, and it was looking like it was going to win until on, I think it was the second, maybe the third day of the trials, the pilot that was demonstrating it forgot to put the wheels down on the thing um, and, uh, and landed it on the airfield um, without the wheels. So he was coming in like that um, with the flaps down, um, but not the wheels down. And he barely landed it on the airfield. Um, and everyone thought that that would be the Piaggio P149 out of the competition and that it was then going to be down to the Saab Sapphire or the um, Beechcraft Mentor but <laughs> the Italian engineers that had taken the Piaggio to the competition jacked the thing up got it into the hangars fixed it overnight including <laughs> swapping an engine because obviously the propeller had damaged the crankshaft on the engine and the next day when everyone was there looking at the aircraft trials um, they were all amazed to see the Piaggio P149 on the flight line um, ready to, <laughs> to carry on with the trials and that is what sealed the deal because they thought a training aircraft that you can repair from a belly landing overnight that has got to be one robust aeroplane um, so it'd be ideal deal for training so you know it um, it really sealed the deal for it so um, what happened was um, Piaggio um, won the competition and started um, providing the training and liaison aircraft for the Luftwaffe now initially Piaggio um, hadn't sold that many P149s I think they'd only sold about 20 or something like that probably not even that but they ended up making 72 for the Luftwaffe um, and after they'd made 72 of them um, they should we have the gear down this time um, the the uh, production transferred to I think Bremen in Germany for the old Focke Wolf factory and they started making them there and they made lots of them there um, and there's a couple of interesting coincidences with how many things how many things were, were made um, because there were 72 of them um, made by Piaggio as kits that were delivered to Germany and constructed at Focker Wolf, and then they delivered another 190 to. Uh, sorry, they, they and then another another 190 were made by Focker Wolf. Yeah, so there's a coincidence. Focker Wolf 190. That's how many Piaggio P149s they made at the Focker Wolf factory. And if you add the 72 to the 190, you get 262 which is another coincidence for German aeroplanes because I'm sure you've heard of the Messerschmitt 262. So there's a couple of interesting coincidences with the numbers on the Piaggio P149. Um, they made um, 262 of them, uh, 190 were actually built by Focke Wolf and the rest of them were kits that were supplied from Piaggio. Um, and I think the total number of Piaggio P149s, including the ones that they built before all of that, that deal for them being the Luftwaffe aircraft. I think there were, were, I think it takes the total up to about 280 or something like that. Um, so if it hadn't have been for that Luftwaffe contract and uh, and uh, Galland and Neumann um, coming second in that race, um, the Piaggio P149 would probably have just been a little bit of a foot, uh, footnote in history. Um, so it just goes to show that um, you know it's not what you know, it's who you know. <laughs> but it's a very, very good aeroplane. Um, as you'll see when I bring this thing in for a landing. Um, so yeah, I bet you thought I was going to land it without the wheels. Um, but yeah, that was just kind of like to point out that's what um, happened when it was being trialed for the Luftwaffe. Someone belly landed it. And you can actually belly land this thing in the sim. Um, uh, if you want to, I, I'm not gonna do it here, but you can actually do it, it does work. Um, and if you think, oh yeah, that'd really wreck it and stuff like that, um, obviously it doesn't do in the sim, but it wouldn't do it too much harm in real life either because uh, that's what happened on those trials. So there you go. Anyway, let's get this thing down. Now, good 
noise when it touches down. That's one of the things that they patched, yeah. That is, incidentally, uh, why. Because uh, this thing's been out for a while. Um, but it's only fairly recently that it was patched. And one of the things that was patched was the touchdown noise when you landed was a bit over the top. It sounded like you were belly landing the thing. Uh, so they changed that. Um, another thing that was a problem with it was... I'm going to get the flaps up. Another thing that was a problem with it was um, it was it was suffering a, a visual glitch where if you went on the external view, sometimes the pilots were appearing slightly hanging out of the cockpit a little bit. It's not the only one that that, um, that was happening to. There's a couple of uh, couple of other um, planes for Microsoft Flight Simulator that do that as well. So it's you know, it a sim problem, but they appear to have fixed it because I've not seen it do that since that patch came out. Another issue um, which was resolved by the patch was it had a few problems with the radio. Um, that's all solved now. There you go. You can see the uh, the radio is working perfectly fine. I can tune things and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so there's no issue with the radio. Yes, the radios are a bit old school in this, but they do work. Um, and it just means that you're going to have to be doing a bit of that um, VOR to VOR um, and ADF stuff if you want to. But it absolutely does work. And, you know, and it's a bit fun to do all that old school stuff. So if you're looking for a nice fairly long range and can carry a fair bit of weight um, training aeroplane that you can do a bit of circuit bashing with that also functions as a Torah because it was originally designed as a Torah before the Luftwaffe started using it um, then this is a very very nice aeroplane um, but keep in mind that if you are a child of the magenta line as they call them who likes autopilots and, uh, and, and getting something to follow a magenta line this is not going to be the aeroplane for you because um, there's none of that, that autopilot GPS malarkey going on with it. But um, if you if you up for a bit of a challenge, then um, as you can see, you can get quite a lot of it in there. You know, four seats and a bit of weight in there, so you know, quite a lot of range um, and quite a lot of capacity. And you can always do that with the map uh, and fly it on the map there and follow the magenta line that way if you want to so and I wouldn't let it put you off because I think you'd be missing out on quite a nice aeroplane I think this is certainly one of the better add-on aeroplanes for Microsoft Flight Simulator that you can get it's it's I'd, I'd say it's up there with the um, with the um, the just flight PA 28 arrow in terms of quality it is that nice it's only the fact that it doesn't really model engine damage of any sort um, that stops it from being really really superb and you never know they might patch it to do that anyway um, but other than that it's a really really nice airplane it's very very stable to fly when I first got this before it was patched because I got it I think the day it came out which is quite a while ago now we had to wait a long time for a patch to come out for this thing when I first got this I thought can you actually fly it in IFR weather even though it's not got an autopilot and I managed to uh, so what I did was I set up the flight simulator with really really cloudy weather where you couldn't see outside the cockpit and I flew it just using that little whiskey compass there um, and managed to keep it on course and flew it a long way um, and that was in sort of like you know zero visibility just using the artificial horizon there and that whiskey compass and it was perfectly fine so it is a really really nice flyer and I mean really really nice it's a lot better than a lot of the other flight simulator planes not fancy in terms of avionics but it's a lovely circuit basher plane so if you're a bit of a history fiend uh, and you like a nice plane that's got a really really lovely old school virtual cockpit then uh, you could do a lot worse uh, than this thing now I'm just going to shut this thing down and uh, we'll wind things down so there's the engine stopped and I'll turn off the fuel pump so we can hear ourselves and I'm going to finish up with an interesting story um, for you because um, we were sort of alluding to Germans going to Argentina and uh, Juan Peron and all that kind of stuff yeah um, so here's a fun tale for you and this is true yeah um, in the 70s my auntie Kathleen uh, had 
a restaurant in Spain called the Cap de Mar and sat outside her restaurant one day um, was the lyricist Tim Rice who wrote the lyrics to Evita um, it was um, Andrew Lloyd Webber that wrote the music Tim Rice wrote the lyrics so he's out sat outside the, on at one of the pavement tables at my auntie Kathleen's cafe uh, and she speaks lots and lots of languages so she she went out and she was talking to him and obviously he's English so she's chatting to him and he's writing the lyrics to a song and she's so she's like like oh what is it you're writing he goes oh I'm doing a musical about Evita um, Eva Peron and she's like all oh, right that's interesting so, so she, can she have a look and he, he was writing a song out um, and she went can I make a suggestion uh, and he said yeah absolutely so and so she said said I don't think the Spanish would actually say that um, I think they'd say a slightly different word because the meanings don't really translate the same um, so he said said well what what would they say um, now the song that he was writing at the time was don't weep for me Argentina and my auntie Kathleen went now nah, they'd say cry they'd say don't cry for me Argentina <laughs> and he crossed it out and changed it to don't cry for me Argentina that's a true story that we had to carefully, so she wrote one word of that song, um, and that was the same tune as the Oh Water Circus, which was at the um, at the start of the at the start of this video and what have you, and the, all the conversations with you know the Luftwaffe and Argentina and and coming back and what have you, and uh, flying this plane in a competition and then it, and being in the Luftwaffe. So there you go. There's a there's a nice sort of going round in a circle story, if you like. Um, anyway. Um, that's it for this episode of um, Jock's Hanger. Um, do I recommend this plane? Absolutely. It's old school. You know, um, it's not offering anything desperately different from from planes that you've already got by default. Uh, but what it is offering is a really, really nice flight model. A really beautiful virtual cockpit with great sounds in it and what have you. So if you appreciate quality, then this thing is worth having. Anyway, um, look out for another Chucks Hanger video um, coming up very soon in the next couple of days, and that's going to be the um, the Aerosoft CRJ, which has uh, been out long enough for me to be playing around with it and checking it out and stuff like that. So that's coming in a day or two. Um, and if you like the uh, like the content of the channel, um, hit that subscribe to the channel button and you can hit the notifications and all that kind of stuff and what have you and in the interim um as ever keep wearing those masks keep keep yourself safe um do hang hang in there for that vaccination and what have you for covid and uh you know um we've not got long to go on that so you know um keep taking the tablets and uh, i'll see you again soon anyway bye